Thank you everyone again. It's it's really my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of our team. And for those who just joined, we are more than 400 registered participants from 33 countries. And this panel is actually the heart of our forum. And we're not only celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, but we're looking closely at it. Does it live to its principles and ideas? Does it fit into the 21st century? And most important, is the idea of solidarity and cooperation possible at all without active engagement as of civil society and not only as beneficiary, but as a strategic partner? So thank you everyone and over to you, Bobo. Um, thank, thank you very much, Gina. We have Apple, um, Bobo. Um, yeah, I'll just put it. Thank you very much, Ina. Um, look, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, okay, so good, good day, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. Um, my name is Bobo Lowe, and it's my great pleasure to moderate this session on the United Nations at 75, Multilateralism and the Future of Global Governance. Uh, to discuss this vitally important subject, we have a most distinguished panel. Uh, we have uh, Leila Bukhari, board member of the Human Rights House Foundation and formerly State Secretary at the Office of the Norwegian Foreign Minister. Welcome, Leila. Uh, she'll be followed by Lolita Sigan, national consultant and expert with the OSCE, ODIHR. Um, Lolita was formerly chair also of the European Affairs Committee of the Latvian Parliament. Welcome, Lolita. Um, and then we have Francis O'Donnell, uh, the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin, and formerly a senior UN official with decades of experience. And finally, we have Mikhail Minakov, senior fellow with the Kennan Institute, principal investigator on Ukraine at the, uh, at the Kennan and editor in chief of the journal ideology and politics. So ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations celebrated its 75th anniversary in October this year. Its uh, sheer longevity, I think, is remarkable in a world seemingly dominated by great power rivalries and the headlong pursuit of national, narrow national self-interest. And the UN has become synonymous for many with the long peace following the end of the Second World War. Um, although it has been widely criticized and mocked, the UN remains emblematic, a symbol of a better world based on international peace and security, fundamental human rights, social and economic progress, and tolerance. And yet at the same time, we are experiencing an acute crisis of multilateralism and the international order. Many of the understandings of the post-World War II system, such as the unacceptability of changing borders by force, have become eroded. The system of international arms control is, is falling apart. Multilateral trade regimes have been undermined by my country first mercantilism. And the prestige of the United Nations of inter and of international institutions in general has rarely been lower than it is today. And we have coronavirus, which has exposed the failings of these international institutions, whether you're talking about the EU or the World Health Organization, but coronavirus has also demonstrated just how essential such international institutions are. Our problems, our interests, are transnational and multilateralism for all its defects is absolutely critical in addressing problems that are beyond the capacity of even the greatest of powers to solve by themselves. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we need multilateralism to work. So my question to the panelists and also to you in the audience is first, how can we make the UN and multilateral institutions more effective? 
there's a lot of talk about UN reform, but what does this mean in practice? My second question is, are today's international institutions, including various United Nations bodies, are they fit for purpose? Or should we be looking at new multilateral structures? Should we put the emphasis on regional rather than global bodies? My third question to you is that today, global threats such as climate change and pandemic disease do not discriminate between democratic and authoritarian regimes. So does the future of multilateralism in the 21st century depend on issues and interest-based cooperation rather than necessarily shared value. And fourth, are we too fixated on state actors and formal multilateral mechanisms in global governance? Or should we focus much more on non-state actors, business, civil society organizations, and informal networking? In other words, is flexibility and diversity the way forward in response to a fast changing and increasingly complex international society. And finally, what would it take for humanity to address universal challenges such as pandemic disease, climate change, global poverty? How bad do things have to get before we really start to work together? So Leila, uh, can you set the ball rolling, please? Thank you, Bobo, and thank you for um, for the opportunity um, to be part of this. Um, I'm hearing the Russian interpretation. Is does it have to be like this? Yes. There's an interpretation button. I just turn it off. You can click on that. There we go. There we go. Let me try now. Sorry about that. Good morning from Oslo, everyone. Oslo, Norway. I hope um, it's a great morning here. I hope it's better uh, where you are. Um, wonderful to be back at the Berlin Forum. Thank you for the um, invitation and thank you all for being here online. Although this year, um, as everything else, more isolated, more digital, let's make the most out of it um, in every sense. And it's very good to see uh, some familiar faces here as well. And it's interesting, isn't it, that it's in exactly these times where we're all so isolated and the world is so fractured that we have the topic of today. Multilateralism, governance, international institutions. Interesting also, and maybe ironic, that it's exactly this year that we are celebrating the United Nations Act 75. In many ways, the very symbol of cooperation, multilateralism and global solutions in a year when we're maybe more isolated in some ways uh, than ever. In its 75th anniversary year, the UN faces a series of really daunting crises. We see a Security Council which is divided over issues such as Venezuela to Iran. We see the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated tensions between China and the US across the UN system. Now widely, widely praised appealed by the UN Secretary General for a global ceasefire in response to the pandemic made real, little real difference to conflicts worldwide. So the question that many of us ask um, is, can the organizations continue to play a significant role in international peace and security in an era where we see this kind of geopolitical competition? And what role can we all play in this, be we governments, private sector, civil society, intellectuals, academics, and journalists. And it will be no secret that I mean, we all have a role to play in this and we all have a stake in this. And precisely that's why we have a role in this. Our world looks fractured in so many ways. There are a myriad of risks and challenges ahead from rising geopolitical tensions, weakening of multilateralism to the growth of autocracies um, and increasing nationalism, as has been mentioned already. Adherence to human rights norms and international agreements is also weakening. Citizens' dissatisfaction with growing inequalities and the sharp increase in poverty exacerbated by the differentiated impact of COVID-19. We see have prompted protests 
movements and activists, I mean, most of our countries around the world, but around, around Europe and the wider Europe as well, trust in governments and institutions is arguably declining. While some would argue we lack the leaders, precisely the leaders who put people and the collective interests of humans and planet at the center of decision making, which is so needed now. Digitalization, our friend and our enemy, <laughs> poses challenges to inclusive governance via the digital divide, overuse maybe of artificial intelligence, and also how the media shapes perspectives and narratives. This opens up ethical as well as technological challenges for all of us. We have the climate emergency, continuing biodiversity loss, ecosystems collapse that are degrading the planet and really threatening even human existence. Conflict is widespread and increasingly protracted with many complex uh, conflicts and heightened risk of fragility occurring. And in all of our countries, you see nationalism, intolerance, xenophobia, violent extremism and radicalization, not only as underlying threats, but very much in open in the day in most of our countries, as I said. Many of these challenges stem from unresolved issues like governance crisis, weak social safety nets or income and health inequalities, maybe a lack of a social contract between um, civil society and governments, the leaders that we are so trusted in. Compounding these, threads, uh, these trends now has been the impact of COVID-19. The pandemic has exacerbated the roots of conflict and tension in our societies. And its long-term in impacts, unfortunately, look, look more bleak than ever. The impact on the job market, supply chains, global trade, and the costs in human capital. All this has reinforced the tensions that are now in society. Now, the danger now is that we all retract in this year of multilateralism. We all retract, look inwards, question what we have. A very natural thing to do in times of crisis, which has been seen in previous crises, how easy it is and how natural it is to look inwards. And we see a weakening of multilateralism, the very belief in it by some prominent state leaders. This may, however, be the time we are forced into a realization, an opportunity that we need to build better structures, better social contracts and governance structures. And we can only address the many issues at stake together. Now, this is, um, we know this, and we've seen this in so many different ways. That's when we should be looking to the international, to the multilateral structures we have and have invested so much in. The UN is still the main platform for multilateralism corporations on a rules-based um, uh, international system. The question is how to make this organization and other regional ones as well, which I know we will be discussing in this panel, more effective more efficient. If we cannot get everyone to agree on a reform, how can we make the organizations that we're talking about more efficient and more effective? And I want to just end with a quote, a recent quote by, by no one else but the uh, UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who says that we have a surplus of multilateral challenges, but a deficit of multilateral solutions. Mm. Now, I will argue that the multilateral solutions are there. We just have to make them work. And it's really up to every one of us, be we civil society, journalists, academics, government officials, to make that knowledge base apparent and to stop questioning, putting distrust into the systems that we have. I'll end there and I know there'll be opportunities to get back to some of these questions. Thank you, Bobo. <laughs> Thank you, Leila. That's a, that's a great analysis. But I am now going to put you on the spot. And uh, now you say there's a, a surfeit of challenges, and it seems like there's a deficit of solution. So, what do you think would be a good first, or second step to um, developing more effective multilateral institutions? Let's start with the UN. What what specifically do you would you advocate? to make 
the UN and its constituent bodies more effective? I, I think that it really comes back to who, what is the UN? The UN is um, an organization of member states and to empower and really bring the responsibility back to the member states and the different um, constituencies that con constitute uh, the member states. So to, to, yeah. to, to re revitalize that dialogue um, with member states, between member states, but also member states and the other stakeholders that are important in this. I think it's been extremely interesting to, and I hope we can, back, can come back to this, some of the, the work that is being done on the SDGs, Agenda 2030, et cetera. You know, who, who are the stakeholders who are really owning the agendas of the Sustainable Development Goals? Very much the private sector very much the, the, yeah, the, the, yeah, um, yeah, the civil society, yeah. etc., to bring and to widen that discussion um, on what are the, 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 the questions of tomorrow and to bring in those stakeholders into the debate, I think will revitalize, um, might revitalize uh, the UN to some extent. Um, and then I think there are some putting issues to the forefront. You know, yeah. um, if climate, if, if, if the UN agrees that climate is one of the um, major challenges of tomorrow, of today, of tomorrow, then put that at the forefront and make the UN um, a body to try to solve these issues um, um, effectively through member states, with civil society, uh, with the private sector, etc. on this. Mm. Um, yeah. And making member states accountable, and I'm not saying yeah. that's easy, yeah. it's never going to be easy. Of course, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, I really think um, that, that might be a starting point um, at the UN. And, and similarly with other regional organizations and others as well, really making member states accountable for, for the, the input um, um, in this. Oh, that's very interesting. And actually, that uh, leads very nicely to uh, Lolita's own experience with the OSCE. Um, many of these issues apply very much uh, to the OSCE as much as they do to the UN. So, Lolita, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I'm so happy to be participating in this panel. And indeed, I actually just had a wonderful experience to practice uh, multilateralism. Uh, I was part of the election observation mission for the UN. I think that we are all witnessing the debacle of uh, US politics that uh, this uh, election has created. So a very, very important process for the future of the whole world. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to just uh, uh, say uh, a few remarks uh, that stand out to me, uh, given uh, this uh, election observation, uh, multilateral organization experience in these times of pandemic. Uh, first of all, what is very interesting is that multilateralism is a phenomena that at some point starts living its own life, so to say, mm -hmm. because it creates so many layers of different interests so many layers of different possibilities that it is very difficult to predict how it will actually work out in practice. And very interestingly, before my uh, career as a member of parliament in Latvia, I had an opportunity to observe two elections in the US, two, uh, 2016 midterm elections, uh, which were just regular elections, and 2008 elections when the president Obama was elected. So for me, this point of comparison was very important, but just uh, referring to our today's topic, very interestingly, this 2020 election, all of a sudden saw an increased and intensive interest of the American side in OSCE efforts. If in 2008, there were two reporters who came to the press conference, and remember, those were times when most things happened uh, in presence, in person. Now, the number of articles that were published throughout the seven weeks of our mission was incredible. We received attention from Washington Post, from Wall Street Journal, uh, Atlantic Council, you name it. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the American society noticed 
that there is an OSCE ODIR which conducts election observation mission. And what is even more important for them, our ability to say that the, that the, the democratic process was conducted properly and they actually, uh, in most respects, uh, conducted the election in accordance to the international commitments of OSCE mm -hmm. was very, very important message to both the civil society, public administration, and also media. So this is just interesting how uh, all of a sudden uh, this multilateral institution that previously um, Americans as a participating uh, state barely paid attention to was really at the forefront of, uh, uh, of their thinking about their own election. And on this, I would like to say that, of course, uh, thinking about the future of the multilateralism, uh, we do uh, get a temptation to think about more regional uh, formations and also about, uh, as you very appropriately said, uh, more issue or interest based approach. However, uh, what I saw also through this uh, election observation experience and in general, the work of OSCE, ODIR, of course, we need to uh, adhere to values. And this mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Once we start shifting towards adhering to issues and interests, it becomes transactional. And when yeah. it becomes transactional, there are clear winners and there are clear losers. Mm -hmm. And then when it becomes transactional, then the multilateralism, unfortunately, will collapse and mm -hmm. will not have this positive, uh, self-sustaining dynamic. Another interesting factor that, uh, uh, that uh, you mentioned in the introduction was um, this whole aspect of non-state actors. Mm -hmm. And this is a very interesting aspect that we also saw in the US election. Very interestingly, the most affluent country in the world, the US, is actually running an underfunded election. The election administration in the US is underfunded. Yeah. And this yeah. stems from this libertarian approach of extreme individualism, everything, everyone fends for themselves, and not too much money should be invested, first of all, in uh, public uh, services, and second of all, in, other, in, in any uh, federal uh, capacity, for instance, to, uh, to inject more cash to uh, uh, election administrations where it is needed. And very interestingly, guess who stepped in? Mark Zuckerberg, through his <laughs> Facebook found, uh, foundation, mm -hmm. he actually uh, provided money to public uh, election administrators to the same amount as the Congress had decided to provide for. And of course, we can speculate on whatever was his motivation to do this, but the, uh, the, the conclusion is, this money was needed and yeah. it was used. However, of course, this raises a very important question about accountability. <laughs> uh, international organizations, yeah. governments, yeah. we yeah. are at least to some extent accountable because there are clear uh, uh, cut criteria. Where, when it comes to the uh, approach, only there are ethical principles that basically guide uh, the way how they conduct uh, this funding. Um, just to uh, finish this view, and I'm sure that we will have an uh, uh, opportunity to discuss it uh, uh, more in detail, uh, the question about what it takes to make sure that we actually move forward the mm -hmm. much needed uh, reforms of uh, multilateral multi uh, organizations, because I have to say that also to me as an election uh, a practitioner as an election act expert. Of course, if we are looking at the Copenhagen criteria, uh, that are, cr are, are criteria for democratic and well-run elections that uh, OSCE participating states committed to, and they were designed in the beginning of 1990s in the immediate uh, phase of uh, 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 post-Soviet uh, uh, Union collapse. They yeah. are naive, they are too general, but we do have them. So it's yep. very important that we have them. Yep. What it takes to make sure that we manage to reform them and uh, to actually bring them up to date 
uh, to capture also phenomena that Leila very appropriately mentioned in her opening speech. It is a very big question. What it took for the European Union as a, as a multilateral phenomenal body to take off. It took two world wars that had about 100 million civilian and uh, military deaths, bloodshed. Yeah. It took uh, for the EU to, uh, uh, to take off. So I do not have a question, an answer to this uh, course, very tough question. We yeah. are fa facing multiple crises, whether they are sufficient to move multilateral organizations forward, I do not know. But what I definitely know is that all efforts should be put into preserving what we already have, because Correct. challenges are multiple. Thank you. Yep. Well, that's great, Lalita. Look, I'm going to um, play devil's advocate at this point here. You say uh, you criticize a interest-based versus uh, values-based approach on the grounds that it would be too transactional. But what do you do on issues like combating climate change, where clearly any successful global effort to address the effects of climate change will require pretty much wholehearted participation, not just by the United States and liberal democracies, but also countries like China, most obviously. So it's all very well to say, yes, it's transactional, but isn't multilateralism transactional anyway? Uh, because it reflects its the, the character of its constituent member states. Um, don't we have to, in a way, make compromises on values in order to uh, obtain um, Chinese cooperation on issues like pandemic disease, like climate change, like even global poverty and inequality. I'm sorry to put this devil's advocate view to you, but I, I'd be interested in your perspective on this. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this question, and I think that is a very important question. And you probably would be surprised, but I would say that this all boils down to communication how you okay. communicate about those issues. What is very interesting also, again, from my US experience, watching the presidential debates and also the presidential platforms, what the US president-elect Biden is stressing is that actually climate change is good for economy. It yeah. will, will generate new economic opportunities. And this is the language that needs to be presented to China. Fighting COVID is economy. It's about economy. We need to get economy going. For that reason, we have to probably even stop it at some point, invest in it, and then get it going. And this is not a departure from the values. We can still very closely keep to our values like fighting poverty and inequality because yep. there are numerous and numerous of studies which actually prove that unequal societies in the long term are not affluent. And yeah. actually, just to finish on the US note, I think the processes that we are seeing in the US right now, to a very large extent, are connected to inequality and high levels of poverty among certain uh, strata of the society. Okay, great. That's a terrific answer. Francis, you've been, you've, uh, worked for decades in the UN and with UN agencies. Uh, what's your take on the sort of the, the future, the evolution of multilateralism in global governance? Thank you very much. Let me begin by paying tribute to Lena and Yura for their vision in creating not just the Moscow School, but in thereby generating this extraordinary diffusion of liberal democratic values and thought under the auspices of the Council of Europe, across the former Soviet space and Europe plus beyond, and once again in partnership with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Now, Matthias Gruden's uh, excellent introduction this morning to the evolution of international human rights law and mechanisms was, I think, a magnificent expose of how we got here and why this continuous renewal of global values is essential for the recovery and promotion of this human and humane universalism. 
Sergei Gurdiev has touched on the great progress we have made and the trauma of the 2020 pandemic and the trade-off between economic versus human well-being in instilling more compassion in our humanism and as an avenue to tackling uh, climate change. So what is left for me to talk about, Bobo? Uh, you've asked the right questions, <laughs> and my remarks will just add some considerations to help us towards answers. Excellent. My contribution today will touch on multilateralism as the institutional expression of dialogue, negotiation, compromise, and common prioritization on a global scale. Okay. It espouses common values as universal and aspires to pluralism through diversity. We may think much of this is in question today, as Lars Hansel has rightly said, but it has always been and to some extent. The challenge is to understand the relative strengths, the trends and factors that play in determining interim outcomes. For there is no ultimate result. We are in a world of flux and of continuous evolution to a point we know not. Although Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and Vladimir Vernadsky had some thoughts on that in their new sphere, our time horizon is also a paramount determinant as we set goals with targets, the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, decarbonization by 2050, and so on. Today, uh, we need to explore, I think, the dynamic between populism, liberalism, and multilateralism. Core values of the UN system, the evolving role of the intergovernmental processes, and the complementarity with civil society and other vectors of influence, including corporate, as these affect the global commons on land, sea, and in air and outer space. They determine our priority challenges and the consequent imperatives for structural and constituency reforms and resources of the United Nations and indeed the Bretton Woods institutions at global and subsidiary levels. It's easy today to forget the era of decolonization mm -hmm. and how it's a bullion explosion of new states magnified enormously the global reach of the UN and the international system. No sooner had it largely been completed than some of the big powers declining in influence desired that the empire strike back. <laughs> in my memory, and it's a bit of a long one, forgive me, the Regan Thatcher or the Anglo-American era, if you wish, was the beginning of the radical questioning of the United Nations. And in due course, what became an assault on multilateralism, especially under Trump. Why was this 1945 entity not fit for purpose? It was also the beginning of the neocon politically and the neoliberal economically that led to vast deregulation. And by the 1990s and the end of the Soviet Union, the rush to privatization, or if you wish, the theft of the global commons, global public goods, and the empowerment of state capture by economic interests. Now, the Human Development Index was in part a response brought about by Amaratya Sen and Mahbub al Haq under the leadership of, of all things, a venture capitalist from California who could see beyond profit, William Draper III, at the time the administrator of the UNDP. Now, let's look a little bit at values for a moment. The Inglehart Valtzel World Cultural Map of the World's Values Survey shows us how traditional values contrast with secular rational values and survival values contrast with self-expression values. The largest increase in emancipative individual agency comes in the transition from industrial to knowledge societies, where existential security is strongest, as in the Western economies, secular norms and self-expression are stronger. Hence, perhaps, a basic income may also help as more countries are beginning to realize. However, it may become a placebo, disguising underlying problems of demographic decline, job insecurity, and rising unemployment, and the changing nature of work in an era of artificial intelligence and increasing automation. The World Values Survey also shows that there is a massive divergence in values between the advanced knowledge-based liberal countries and the more traditional and insecure societies where basic needs remain a struggle. But in recent years, it has also shown us that this divergence is mirrored inside the advanced societies as brought about sharply by recent studies of the sociology of Trumpism and the huge electoral divide in the USA between urbanism, liberalism, education and prosperity of Democrats and the more rural and traditional conservatism 
of Republicans themselves sharply divided between plutocrats and what we might provocatively call distressed white proletariat. But see Ernesto Zedillo's former Mexican president's excellent article two days ago in Noema on rebuilding a multilateral world after Trump. Internal disparities are growing everywhere, as was pointed out by previous speakers, but at the international level, multilateralism must deliver. And I would say as regards populism, populism is in retreat following Biden's tentative win, we hope, then, but this must not become an excuse for liberals and government to ignore the legitimate grievances that were exploited by populism, populists, for much of the problems are real, even if their solutions were the wrong ones or suboptimal. Worse, they are now profoundly aggravated by the economic downturn of this pandemic, touched on by Leila Bukhari a moment ago. Therefore, the downsides of globalization need redress if we are to keep free trade and relatively free movements of labor and capital. Now, apart from the obvious mantra of going green in a challenge of tackling climate change, one starting point is to shift from shareholder to stakeholder capitalism, as the American Business Leaders Forum recommended, and Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum also recently endorsed this, but we have to avoid managerialism, as they call it. Another is to shift away from a purely growth model of economic well-being towards ecological sustainability. Yeah. A third is to regulate corporatism equitably and tax digital commerce beyond mere voluntary instruments such as the UN Global Compact and the OECD principles of corporate governance. A fourth is to consolidate digital governance across its many domains. And fifthly, there is a need to reform the World Trade Organization to take account of the phenomenal rise of e-commerce during the pandemic and beyond. And following on Thomas Bagger's talk this morning, we must do more to end impunity and strive for a universal ratification of the International Criminal Court and treat vaccines for coronavirus as a global public good yeah. and advance the understanding and cause of climate change. So on the one hand, we have the greatest success in development progress and the governance of the global commons, the corpus of international law and regulations, without which we would have no international telecommunication, no Zoom, no air travel, maritime predictability, nor peacekeeping. Our world would be wracked by feudal wars and destruction like the dark ages in Europe. But there is a, ca a case for optimism. On the one hand, the current pessimism has become a self-fulfilling prophecy leading to fear and unilateralism, but if downside risks are better managed collectively, catastrophe can be avoided. And historians in the future, I believe, will rightly regard our time as the best in history. Until the pandemic hit, more and more people everywhere were enjoying better lives than before. Finally, now we need to recover that and build forward better with compassion and as Joras rightly said, with love. The UN and the Bretton Woods institutions and other multilateral instruments can get us there as there is nothing better but we must do it with more openness and greater civic participation everywhere through inclusive governance pathways. And as Lolita Sigan has just pointed out, the media have a huge role to play, but tackling market concentration, I would say, will be essential to fair play in that sector as in others. But that's a topic for another day. Thank you for allowing me to give these few suggestions towards answers. <laughs> there, um... They're great suggestions, but Francis, I'm going to, I'm going to again, put you on the spot here. Well, you always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my concern when I look at uh, the, a lot of the debate about Trump and Biden is that we tend to over-personalize things. So we, uh, we blame Trump for everything rather than considering that Trump might actually be more a symptom of a, mal a deeper malaise rather than the cause of problems. Of course, he's both, but perhaps he is more symptom than cause. And equally, that we it's we invest too much hope in Biden. That Hello. Are you with us? Okay. I think the gremlins have got Bobo. I don't, 
I think we lost Boba for a second. So probably when he's back, then he'll ask his question to you, Frank. And uh, I think we just continue with Misha. Misha, so we don't lose time. Can okay. You step in? Thank yes. you. I will step in and uh, I would like to join the Francis thanks to to Lena and uh, Jura for supporting the dialogue and conversation about universalism, universal values, but also universal practices. This is something that really lacks not only in Europe or post-Soviet space, but globally as well. And I would like today, today to speak about universalism from philosophical point of view. Optics of universalism looks at what unites humanity as a community of living people in all countries of the world, and as a community of living, dead, and not yet born generations. And among these, this outlook of universalism, there are individual rights, equality at individual level, at the level of groups, including majorities and minorities within society, and equality of peoples in global context. Universalism is about solidarity of living creatures as well, not only humans. Life is a shared space between humans and other living creatures. And this is also universalism. Universalism had a long path as a value system, but also as a practice system. And today we know that it should not be hierarchy. It should be a balance of plural interests of human and non-human creatures, of groups, societies, and humanity. And this is the real uh, multilateralism that we talk to today about, not only governmental multilateralism. Mm -hmm. So in a way, my thesis is that universalism is an adequate way to see sameness and sharedness of life, love, and creativity, but also hate, weakness, and death. And at institutional level, the universalism as a set of practices is very limited today. Uh, state is one of the several players with the universalist potential, but this potential is very limited. Yes, 75 years ago, or let's say three generations ago, UN was created, and it was in a way an institutional setup that survived but also helped to guide creation of a new world system. There was a huge expectation of the generation of the founders of UN to create a, an equal states order with universal political and legal order leading to lasting, possibly perpetual peace. And the world system that we have today uh, represents a new form of interstate inequality. There is like two or three generations of scholars also associating themselves with UN and UN agenda, but who also shows that there are cores, core states and peripheral, peripheral states. There's also extreme periphery, states that are not recognized and not included and which uh, with the, the populations of which are excluded out of uh, universal agenda. So, uh, in a way, UN represents a brave new attempt to create a universalist political system, political order in, on the planet. But it also shows certain level of betrayal to universalism. Today, UN is an international or interstate or intergovernmental organization with special role of executive. It gets the international role of executive branch only. And let's remember that executive, the government, the cabinet of ministers per se, has an internal biopolitical antinomy. There are governmental agencies that support life, like Ministry of Health. But there, there are also other ministries that are pro-death. And this combination of executive is kind of natural but by uh, making it global, making the executive uh, universal, we also bring into these UN structures the both players, in a way. The, then there is a room for legislatures and judiciaries 
to enter into this interplay. And creation of international criminal court is one brave step in doing it. But there should be more. And legislatures should play much bigger role in new reformed UN. Uh, in a way, today UN as such is a space or as idea where the, the, there is a clash of understanding what sovereignty is. Is it sovereignty of governments or is it sovereignty of peoples or is it sovereignty of humanity? Mm. And these contradictions that are visible today, we really must address them in reforming UN, but also other international pro-peace, pro-rights organizations. Uh, and there are possibilities in non-state sector, which Lila and uh, Lolita and Francis were talking about. So we need to bring in other constituencies uh, in order to really make uh, the UN multilateral. So uh, just to conclude several ideas, it's inter-societal cooperation on global issues, environment, peace, war, but some other, like today's uh, epidemic. There should be also a global dialogue of local administrations. Council of Europe has a very vast experience in doing it, and definitely this is something for UN to learn from. IMF and other global organizations connected to economic and financial uh, exchange should be reformed and reviewed. They are rather agents of inequality in the world system rather than equality. And also interreligious global dialogue should become part of UN. It's also something that is missing. When you read the debates of intellectuals in the generation of founders of UN, this agenda was somehow resembled, but it, it's gone lost with the domination of governments in UN. And also global scholars, self-governing bodies should become part of it. If religion is there, why academia is excluded? Something that drives the progress is the big silent in this global dialogue. So in a way, every generation has a room to better the world and improve the UN. I'm, I'm definitely against like destroying UN as uh, organization. Destruction is easy it's much better and smarter to use the resource, to use the institutions and continue bettering it, creating it to a more inclusive and more multilateral uh, dialogue space. Thank you. Thank you, Michal, and apologies for cutting out. I've, uh, that's, that's, that's very good. Um, look, I just wonder sometimes whether state actors in the multilateral system have uh, in a way generated their own culture, so to speak, so that there is a kind of statist culture within multilateral institutions that actually makes multilateralism less effective. And therefore non-state actors in a way have to try and, they have to work with the system, but they, in many respects, they perhaps in order to be really Hello? Yeah. You hear? You hear me? Yeah. We lost you for a okay. second. Yeah. Um, do non-state actors need to circumvent the state, the multilateral system of states, as well as to work with it? I know that sounds that is that sounds and is contradictory, but in a way, they need to. A lot of the communication has to be informal networking, non-state networking, rather than necessarily going through inefficient state and multilateral status structures. Did you hear me? Yes. Can I, can I jump in on that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, we often think of the UN system as only governments. And within the UN system, there are some entities which are much more inclusive. The International Labour Organization, for example, has a tripartite structure. You have governments, you have the trade unions, and you have the employers. And they all come into play in terms of the decision-making process. The UN Center for Human Settlements, also known as Habitat, when it has held, has held some of its global conferences like 
uh, 24 years ago in, in Istanbul when I was in Turkey, um, they have a, a, an assembly of, of, of cities and you get the municipalities coming in as another lower level of governance than the, the national or the state level. Uh, so I think there, there's, there's, there are examples already in existence okay. within the UN system as to how we can be more inclusive. But uh, what we lack is a chamber of representatives of civil society or a chamber of representatives, for that matter, of the corporate side of the World Economic Forum and Davos tends to more or less play some kind of a role on that. Let me just also, uh, as a footnote, uh, and to come back to what you posed to me earlier, Bobo, <laughs> this question of blaming Trump and, and so on, blaming personalities. I think when I when I started talking about Regan, Regan and Thatcher, I, I was not trying to blame Regan and Thatcher so much. Sure, as sure. No, I realize. I realize. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, the questioning of the UN, mm. to some extent, well-founded questioning, goes back decades. Mm. And in fact, what we have seen over the past few decades because of the growing disparities between countries and within countries, yeah. rising inequality, I think this underpins a lot of the problems we have. And therefore, to overcome these things, we need to have greater inclusive participatory decision-making processes, which were espoused by all member states of the yeah. United Nations yeah. in the Millennium yeah. Declaration 20 years ago. So I think there is fertile ground for making systems and structures more inclusive. In fact, we cannot but do it. And, you know, to come to Misha's point about the, the little baby animals and all the other creatures in, in, in nature, we are, of course, part of that ecosystem. Okay. And unless we begin to respect it more, we doom ourselves and not just the, the species that are falling extinct rapidly at the moment. Before I go to Ina, I, 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 Misha, you wanted to come in just to... Well, I, I think what Francis said is actually continuing my, my argument. Mm -hmm. UN has a lot of uh, documents, conventions, agreements at certain level, but when it comes to decision making, there's a lack of this chamber. And yeah. I really endorse this idea of creating multilateral dialogue at UN level between different chambers. Mm. It cre can create, and here I, I would also refer to what was Lolita saying, that the, the more bodies there are, the more complex system of decision making is, the, the, the more difficult it is to implement and this implementation uh, issue comes into the picture but let's remember that it's always that the, there is a problem between democratic decision making and implementation of decisions the longer you make them the more inclusive you are the smarter the decision is but then there should be a balance again multilateralism should also balance this dilemma Thank Great, Misha. Thanks very much for that. Ina, you have uh, a, yes. a series of questions from the people in the audience, uh, I, and some of them are really excellent questions. So over to you. Thank you so much. Indeed, we have so many questions, but uh, I think we should not think of our aspirations as, as manageable. Our aspirations should be grand. So, so far, I've grouped some questions um, into at least two rounds, and there will be many questions. But we will be asking you to command as brief as possible to uh, let all the voices sound. So the first round would be on the universalism and UN reforms. Some questions you have addressed, uh, but I, I will still uh, read them out. So the first question would be from Jack Haney, the Secretary General of the Association of School of Political Studies of the Council of Europe. And he's asking why stigmatize international civil servants such as Kofi Annan and so many other good people as scapegoats for the decline of universal values? And what about cynical veto waving governments, totalitarian tyrants, fanatical fundamentalists and populists? And a question from Toki from Iliada Gedik. What's the advantage of uh, and disadvantage of universalism? Uh, why citizenship is important and what can we do to restore universalism? Um, and now to the UN reforms. Asil Ayaganova and Alexander Malarenko both are asking about the future of um, the UN reforms. Uh, Roman Zaharov is asking about the, what the civil society can do to help uh, United Nations to act more effect effectively in terms of progress and democratization. And now two very important questions. One from Elizaveta Strokova from Tatarstan about the right to veto 
And can we come back to uh, the conversation about reforming this one? And the question from Sveta Shmilova, I'll read it in Russian. I just received it. Um, it seems uh, a great value that 193 countries have come together and have agreed to support peace and security in human rights and fairness and equity. At least UN Charter is all about this. But if we look at UN today, in today's reality, we shall see there are no nations, no citizens, and after 75 years, only government officials have a say. Whereas civil society, without its involvement, it's impossible to address local problems, let alone global, that require greater solidarity. How can we trust in this institution when we citizens are not there? There should be a chamber of civil society present at the United Nations. And that's actually one of the questions of our forum. How can we as civil society be recognized? How can we um, make our voice uh, loud enough to be heard? So now over to you. Thank you. And keep in mind that we have another big round of questions. <laughs> um, Francis, why don't you set things going? Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I think if I can just touch momentarily on the whole question of UN reform. Um, the UN has gone through con fairly frequent episodes of reforms over the decades that most people in the public are not aware of, probably because they look at the UN Security Council and they see something that is not reformed, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. But many of the other institutional things have come under reform. And quite often at the global system level, uh, for example, we used to have what was called an administrative committee on coordination, which was the directors generals, secretaries generals of all the different UN bodies and affiliated agencies. This is now called the CEB, the Chief Executives Board, and it's working very differently than it used to. But on the question of the Security Council, and very briefly, the Security Council is a framework. You have to think of it as a chamber for basically five principal countries to agree. The superpowers who wield the veto. It's really no more than that. When they agree, it empowers them collectively to impose their will on the rest of us. And it's only really useful when the five agree. The veto was wrongly designed from the beginning to enable a single spoiler to obstruct global peace and security and to obstruct solutions to regional problems. Uh, so it alone is not fit for, for today's world. The Security Council was never fit, not even at its foundation. It was inherently undemocratic, a compromise between imperial powers, including the USSR, biased by veto against a majority, inherently undemocratic, and like most of its members, democracy, unfortunately, over the past 15 years, is in decline. Now, that's what needs to be, to be corrected. And one of the corrections would be to change the nature of the veto, make it, abolish it ideally, I would say, or make it some kind of a qualified majority veto of okay. yeah. three of the big five or plus others or something like this. But it's very difficult to ask somebody with power to give it up. It rarely happens in human society. The other thing is to expand the council from the current 15 members to 22 or 25. And importantly, to get India, the world's largest democracy, in as a permanent member with or without a veto. But China, despite all its, its pontificating about multilateralism, obstructs India as a permanent member, as it obstructs many of the regional uh, uh, solutions, including the law of the sea in the South China Sea and territorial disputes in the Himalayas with India and so on. So we're not yet there, but I would say apart from the Chinese obstruction, there seems to be a large majority of, of the powerful member states being in favor of bringing India in to the fold. So that would be one step, but a very small step in a much larger picture of reforms that we need to pursue. But it's a continuing process. We have to get, the UN will never be perfect because we live in a world in flux, but we must continually struggle to change it, reform it, make it more inclusive and make it more effective. One of the key issues is resourcing the UN. Some countries, the United States in particular, have been 
consistently stripping it of resources and obstructing its ability even to carry out peacekeeping operations. That has to change and hopefully with Mr. Biden it will. Thank you, Frank. Um, anyone else would like to comment? Um, yep. Misha? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I would like to say that this idea of inclusive, inclusivity is very important. We, we, we talk about it and multilateralism as part of inclusivity is very important. But don't forget, well, this, this is, we, we live in a world full of contradictions where pro-life and pro-death coexist even within one human body. But remember that many civil society organizations in separate societies do support the wars if they think that it's just war for their particular reasons, for their particular purposes. Or there, there are organizations, global organizations that promote their particular interests. And uh, in order to create a really universal organization and work with humanity, individuals and different groups, we need to, I, I think from the philosophical point of view, the pluralist universalism is actually the response also as a policy, also as an organizational principle, and also as institutional principle. So inclusivity or pluralist universalism should be based on deliberation with, with particular groups of particular interests, but in universal contrast and would create a more balanced uh, system of responses. Let's be realist even when we are utopian or when we think about UN, UN-topia, if you wish. Uh, uh, this UN-topianism should remember that there's a human being per se is a very contradictory uh, being. And we should create institutions that support this pro-life intentions in us and limit our pro-death uh, intentions. That's the only possible way for us as reasonable creatures to go on in the world where there is room for life. And here it can be applied to economics, to politics. This permanent growth economy is impossible. It simply exhausts this life world. Simple growth politics exhausts the, the human world as well. But also let's remain the realists and let's see at power and respect the power. So this dialogue with those monopolists in also the five power world the five powers in the globe they, they also should be involved by different means and with with different tools and this is the the task number one probably in looking at the un reform thank you thank you anyone or shall we pass to the next Today. round of questions Yes. Could I, could I jump in here, uh, yes, Bobo? In a, um, um, there's, there's so many interesting points here, and I think the issue of UN reform. Um, uh, you know, there's so many been so many generations of attempt <laughs> of UN reform, um, but I still think you know you can't give up on it, um, it and, and it's really about trying to, as, as Francis said, you know, nobody gives up power. Um, once you have it. But how do you change that mechanism? I have no answer to that. What I really wanted to, to comment on is another issue, which, which a question also came in on, on civil society at the UN. I think very rightly, as Francis said, you know, there are bodies where civil society or, or different stakeholders are very much part of it. Now, I haven't followed the UN um, as long as Francis have, but I it can say that, and sorry, that was not meant as any anything but what it was francis but but um but but i followed the un over the last uh, 10 15 years and from forums such as the the general assembly the high level policy forum hlpf the commission on women the csw you see a tremendous um input and lobbying by civil society side events etc are um, mushrooming um and 
in my view, and at least for my government, uh, Norway, this is not a symbolic side event. These are not just symbolic side events. These are uh, civil society actors and stakeholders who in very many cases have been able to push agendas, push forward agendas. And I, I really don't want to leave this panel with a, you know, a bleak sort of picture of it. There are things happening, which I think Yes, there are powerful state, states and veto powers. And, and, you know, in many ways we're seeing the UN, in some ways we're seeing the UN um, going the wrong way, but we're also seeing some kind of a movement from civil society actors. Now it boils down to, I think, to leaders and leadership and governments who really believe in the input of civil society in this. Luckily, you know, I, I, I've worked with the government who very much believes in this and the dialogue that needs to be there. Um, Misha talked about, Michael and Misha talked about the global dialogues. Yes, let's have them more and more in the picture and let us academics and civil society push for those global dialogues on different on different fronts whether it is a side events uh, of the of the different events at the UN or in different circles I really truly believe that this can change and push agendas forward um, not naively but but you know uh, carefully and slowly this can push agendas forward um, and will be listened to um, at times. Thank you so much, Laila. Um, actually, a question right now from uh, the chat from Pavel Minshutkin, and this is an important question. He's asking, is there any mechanism of um, adding the voices of civil society into uh, the work of the UN? And during the big plenary sessions uh, dedicated to the 75th anniversary, actually the UN uh, themselves voiced this uh, demand that they said that they need civil society as a strategic partner. But we hear from our side, um, at this point, uh, where knocking on all the doors, uh, but we do not see any clear possibility to make ourselves heard. So what can we do as civil society to, to establish any relationship, uh, to make any first steps? And one quick comment from Vater Jankesov from also the uh, chat right now. He, um, this is a one step back. He's asking that when he asked Przezinski at the Open World uh, Seminar in the UN, United Nations, um, why UN is not coping with its main um, task force keeping peace on earth. And Drzezinski said that the dysfunction of the United Nations is in the fact that some, um, that the, for example, the voice of the United Nations equals the voice of Romania or the voice of Russia equals the voice of Uzbekistan. So what would you think about that? Would you be able to comment on that? And then we go straight forward to the next round of questions. Thank you. I would like to comment on uh, the civil society. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I just saw that Lena and Yuri are also with us. Privet is Rigi was tak tak priyatno vidit sivo samovo khoroshovo. Хорошо, что вы с нами здесь. They're always with us. Yes. Я только что увидела. So uh, just uh, very briefly about the civil society. I think that um, in general, we have some excellent examples of how civil society is using uh, these multilateral formats. If we are thinking about the Council of Europe, for instance, I was in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly delegation. And this was a very important forum for the democratic civil society and also democratic oppositional parties from Russia, from Belarus, from Azerbaijan, where they made their voices heard. Similarly, for instance, the European Parliament has a very good tradition of organizing events where they give voice to people uh, of, for instance, Eastern Partnership countries, which do not have any other platform where to speak and also to raise awareness of uh, MEPs. So basically what I would feel is that I, I found this uh, concept of a chamber of civil society that Francis uh, uh, described very, very valuable. And we should definitely draw on the experiences that we already have 
of inclusion of making sure these voices are heard. Because also working as a member of parliament uh, in Latvia, what I've seen is that very often for the civil so society, the most important signal from the decision makers and also civil servants is we hear you, we see you, we know your grievances, and we give you a platform where we can discuss and express this. Can I just Thank add you. a word there? Yeah, totally. Thank uh, you. To what Lolita has, has correctly said. There is, of course, one of the big chambers that we have is the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, where an NGO, a non-governmental organization or a civil society organization, can officially register and at the moment there's about 4,000 of these registered and they therefore have consultative status with the Economic and Social Council which has a special platform where these uh, where civil society can therefore actually be heard. It doesn't mean that they necessarily take, play, take part in decision-making processes and that is perhaps a weakness but you know there is there is a way that the voices can be heard and that can be amplified and maybe we need something more than that and and uh, and i think that you know the member states are increasingly probably realizing uh, through the pressures they feel themselves and especially as a result of social media digital media they are now beginning to realize that more needs to be said more voices need to be heard and there needs to be an effort to be make decisions more inclusive and cohesive Thank you, Frank. Um, are we ready to go to the next um, round of questions? Okay, um, the next one it is. Um, United Europe and multilateralism. The first question is from Robert Skidelsky. He just sent it in. Um, to revitalize the multilateral institutions, you need to find a way of bringing China and more generally Asia into the heart of international decision making. This depends, as a minimum, on a functional deal between China and the United States based on a agreement on global challenges and a common approach. In short, one needs to extinguish vestiges of the old Cold War mentality, which is the main obstacle to fashioning multilateral solutions to common problems. And a subsidiary but still important need is for Europe to get it act together. And Germany has to take the lead here. Uh, the next question is from Bariana Filipovska, Slovenia. Questions relating to migration, including the protection of human rights and the environment within the din uh, dynamism of today's world. And then we have a question from Andrei Kuznetsov, uh, Moscow. How did the trends of um, 2020 affect the United Europe? How Europeans will respond to your skepticism, right-wing populism and Islam Islamic extremism? From Sergei Bolshakov, St. Petersburg, Russia, what are the European Union preferred options for reboot? Would the transition to regional autonomy continue and what was the role of nation states in this regard? And um, a big comment from Agnieszka Kanievska. I tried to read it and you, um, anyone pick uh, who will be commenting on this, um, about Poland, that Poland has been in the spotlight of uh, the United Nations since the beginning of the rule of law crisis. And um, in December of 2019, High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Robert Colville expressed deep concern due to a new draft legislation linked to the judiciary in Poland. And since 2015, we can observe dismantling democratic institutions, in particular the judicial system. The actions of the United Nations or the European Union bring practically nothing. And while we debate about values, but I have the impression that they're not crucial. The words are beautiful, but in practice it looks different. And um, all the time values lose out with pragmatism. Um, it's a very big comment. Um, those of you, uh, you can look into the chat and um, read it through. Um, but I think we should uh, hear your first comments on this um, because we're really, really short in time. We have um, 30 minutes. So Misha, you start, please. Yes, thank you. Well, basically, I would like to uh, pick up Agnieszka's and several other uh, raised issues and say that there is, well, universalism is lost. In many ways, it's lost as a practice, 
a little bit less lost as a value, but definitely there is a problem. And the biggest challenge today is sovereignty. When there is an, a group of power elites in certain states take over the political system, then economic system, and then legal system, and they promote their own agenda. It can be nationalist, it can be populist, it can be sovereign democracy agenda as in Russia, but all together, you can see how universal principles are denied from, from the very beginning. And the spread, the, these systems tend to spread the values of uh, particularism as a conservative nationalism, as a conservatism of different kinds that undermine the very principle, for example, of human rights, of rule of law. And instead they promote so-called uh, morality, as in Poland, or illiberal democracy, as in Hungary, or sovereign democracy, as in Russia, or they promote even ideas and practices that sooner or later lead to wars. And in our part of the world, it's Donbas war, there's a Karabakh war, to which universal principles-based organizations do not have proper mechanisms to react fast or to limit the damage that these wars can do. So yes, there is this illiberal turn, there is a decline of effective democracies. This is part of uh, political science monitoring that are published recently. And we face, we face the situation when we have a long tendency of um, broken democracy, well, all democratic institutions do not function as effectively as they used to do 20 years ago. And it's a challenge for our generation to come up with solutions. I'll, I'll stop with this. Thank you, Misha. Frank? Yeah, let me just uh, come in there a little bit with um, uh, a response on the question of the European aspect of this. And, and I think, uh, when we look at the European Union and we look at the Copenhagen criteria, the acquis communautaire, and the extent to which European integration remains extremely attractive to the countries on the periphery, it is very difficult to understand why some of those more recent entrants from Romania, Bulgaria to Poland and Hungary uh, should express such, um, I would say, objection and difficulty to uh, a lot of the things that we are supposed to be doing, including approving the budget right now, where Poland and Hungary are, are particularly obstructive. But uh, part of the, the, the whole ch challenge, I think, on the European level is, is to give more credence to the diversity within the EU member states themselves, the regions, uh, somehow to have peaceful ways of resolving Catalan concerns or Basque concerns or concerns in Corsica or Scotland or Northern Ireland or, or wherever it is. And, and, and we need an ex to an extent to look at some of the ways that our existing member states are structured because a lot of them are based on post-Westphalian models of governance. We have an enormous number of monarchies still be they constitutional or part parliamentarian or what, not every member state of the EU is necessarily a, re a republic, uh, although uh, they may be a res publica in, in, the, in the sort of more traditional Latin sense. So there are lots of issues there that are works in progress, I would say, that we need to continue to work internally in Europe and beyond the EU, I would say, even in the context of the Council of Europe itself. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that, of course, this question of, of uh, human rights is, is fun fundamental, but we tend to see it from an individualist perspective in the Western world. And the Universal Declaration is something which gave expression to the, the dignity of the human person and the rights of that individual to have certain things. From an Eastern perspective, it's looked at somewhat differently, more in terms of collective rights and collective identity and community concerns. And one of the things that came about I would say around the time when discussions were taking place in the UN on a new international economic order. This is a debate that's now decades old, but was the, uh, the coming into existence of this charter on the economic and right, economic rights and duties of states, which mm. tried to counterbalance 
the individualist Western perspective with something that was a bit more communitarian, if you can call it that. And again, you have the issue of principal versus transactional. And I would say that in the UN system, we have both. We, we try to have the principles underpinning our approach to solutions. But when you get to negotiating compromises, it tends to be transactional. And that's probably understandable. But we shouldn't lose sight of the principles. And one of the ironies of the modern age, I think, is the extent to which elites have become relatively disempowered. Uh, we have an erosion of authority, whether it's religious, whether it is scientific in the populist era, or whether it is uh, institutional in some other sense. And part of this has been due to a growing education of the masses, if you want to speak in those populistic terms. Um, but it's also, I think, part of the digital world that the social media have become empowering of a multitude of diverse views. And sometimes it has been very easy for some people to capture that technology and use it as they did with Cambridge Analytica or with the election of Trump and so forth. And what we need to try and do is get more social, corporate social responsibility and political social responsibility into the centers of power that exist, including the centers of corporate power, and in particular, the digital media giants. And, you know, we shouldn't have to depend on the likes of Zuckerberg to suddenly see mm -hmm. the light in the, in, in the sky. There should be instruments that, that enforce certain types of corporate norms. Uh, in terms of ethics. So, you know, it's a, we're in a world which is a work in progress. We just hope it doesn't regress. And, um, you know, we all need to work together to find the solutions. A question I want to put to all our panelists, just as a sort of, uh, to conclude really is, do you think we've already hit the low point of multilateralism and that really in a way we've, we've well, it's, onwards and upwards from here on in, so that we've had our existential crisis and that multilateralism is now seen to be the most effective route, even if we have to try and fix and reform multilateral institutions in the process. I'd like to, uh, Lalita, what do you think? Uh, whether this is the lowest point, we do not know because uh, sometimes it seems that we are at the lowest of the low and then we just go lower. So let's hope it is. But I think there are two very important questions that we can learn from this time. First of all, multilateral institutions do have to be reformed and upgraded during the good times. And I believe that we have wasted a lot of time and have been very complacent and happy with what we've had in the good times. One good example, for instance, a small example, is how the EU has upgraded itself in terms of having veto powers. It has actually rolled back this possibility of a, uh, of a country to veto everything. So there gradually has been introduced more of uh, qualified majority voting and this has actually allowed the EU to move forward despite the difficulties that were mentioned, for instance, with Poland. So this leads me to the second point. Maybe, just maybe, this very deep crisis of multilateralism is the time when we really have to very seriously start talking about getting rid of the veto power. Because this goes against the very nature of multilateralism. The question is not whether to get rid of it, but it's how, isn't it? So power. Sorry, I didn't hear the question fully. How are you going to get rid of the veto power? I think, uh, What's uh, the practical? Yes, uh, a million uh, dollar question. I think we all need to talk, be, start talking about it. And uh, a pressure from civil society groups, from the media, from the think tanks, analyzing how poisonous it is. The okay. European Union currently is being poisoned by the possibility of Hungary and Poland to veto uh, the budget and the stimulus package. And also, actually, again, just going back to the US, I think partly we see this problem there too, because obviously not only veto power, but also two-party dominance 
is bad for current democracy, for current age. So one of, one of the questions from the chat right now about actually speaking about poison, poisoned uh, in Council of Europe, that uh, now uh, from Stanislav Stanskich, uh, that Council of Europe now includes several authoritarian states, in fact, in violation of its own 1949 statute. And I would appreciate your thoughts on the future of the uh, Council of Europe. And I think that would be like a very short comment to the last round. And Frank, I, I uh, saw your hand. So would you like to come in first? Yeah, I, I'm just, just on the question of, of um, uh, I would say, um, multilateralism coming back. Um, I would agree with Lolita. I, I would add that um, uh, if we're just to limit ourselves to the globalist perspective of uh, uh, a Trump defeat and a Biden win. We could we could be a bit euphoric about a return of multilateralism, but I think that a, a real uh, challenge is going to be to address the massive disempowerment of the millions, perhaps even billions of people across the world as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdowns and the loss of jobs that have been uh, that have, that have come about, um, about a half a billion, according to the ILO, of formal employment, and maybe as much as one and a half to two billion in terms of the informal sector. And, and the only way, or one of the ways that this can be overcome is through economic stimulus packages. But this has to come also from a greater largesse and generosity of the industrialized countries through the Bretton Woods institutions, through a special release of special drawing rights that would allow the poorest countries to actually get favorable treatment, in particular, starting with the forgiveness of the existing debt portfolios, rather than a simple rescheduling of debt. And uh, the US has under Trump been somewhat against a special SDR or special drawing rights mechanism in the IMF. But I think that hopefully with Biden, we may have some more flexibility on that. And the good point about it is that interest rates are, are so extremely low as they are. Uh, the other thing I think, uh, which you mentioned at the Council of Europe, um, I would prefer that somebody else would pick up on that question because I'm not an expert on the Council of Europe. And so uh, maybe somebody else would pick up on that challenge, somebody who has more direct experience with the Council of Europe. Um, anyone? Do we have anyone here? Meanwhile, I have to really apologize for all those questions that well, we didn't have you, time to ask. <laughs> yes. Uh, um. uh, on Council of Europe, um, I was uh, part of the uh, PACE delegation for four years. And of course, there was always this challenge to the Council of Europe, whether Azerbaijan and Russia joining the Council of Europe will change the Council of Europe or the Co Council of Europe will change them. And unfortunately, there have been occasions where the latter has happened. These two countries joining has changed the dynamics of the organization. Still, the organization does some terrific reporting. For instance, the fact that so many countries introduced Magnitsky, so-called Magnitsky sanctions, which actually prevented so many uh, people close to the official uh, Russia's regime benefiting from the two uh, from the benefits of the two worlds earning their money um, in corrupt way in Russia and enjoying the benefits of the Western world this was largely to the uh, 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 this can be largely referred to the fact that Council of Europe did very good reporting on this it was very factual evidence-based so I would say that the Council of Europe has had its difficulties but still it has a huge potential and I encourage everyone, including our listeners from the regions of Russia, to use Council of Europe, write emails to them. In these times of pandemic, we all live digitally. Do not spare time on writing, bombarding, making sure that you record small videos about the situation you have, about the issues you are facing in terms of human rights abuse. This organization has to respond. And from my experience, I have seen that you can still find someone who will hear you. Thank you so much. I, um, I'm afraid, afraid that we are really, really out of time here. And um, I don't know whether Lena uh, want to say it or I can probably say it on behalf of all of us. Uh, 
we wouldn't be able to answer all the questions. Thank you. Pasivo Yuri Petrovich. But I really think we should continue this conversation. All of you who didn't have time to ask your questions, please, uh, we apologize, but please save those questions. And we definitely have to come back all together for uh, for another meeting uh, with all the panelists and continue this conversation. And I really, really think, and I have a feeling that solidarity, that this is what we're all coming to. And this is what I've heard uh, in between the lines in everything that all of you said. And this is a virtue and this is a wonderful state to be, and it gives hope. So thank you all. Our next stop is in 30 minutes for a talk with Ian Buruma stay with us and um, really, really priceless contributions. Um, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.